I'll just start. If you haven't got a seat, you can make yourself at home. <laughs> um, I'll try to make this an informal talk uh, because it's not too technical and it's just kind of like a, maybe it's just a fun break from all the deep technical stuff you've been going on uh, in this last three days. It's just about my journey from um, uh, uh, South Africa to moving to Portugal and how I kind of mapped my new environment using QGIS. So um, I see lots of my friends in the room, but maybe some of you don't know me. I need to find this. Uh -huh. uh, so this is me, 33% um, uh, conservationist, 33% QGIS nerd, and now news 33% uh, farmer. Um, and uh, this, the farmer part is new because I moved onto a small piece of land, uh, three hectares in Portugal. And um, uh, I want to just tell you a story um, in this presentation. Uh, there may or may not be cats in the story. Um, and it's, uh, it has a baddie in the story. This is, um, I won't say who it is on mic, but uh, it's a baddie. And um, uh, it has a country divorce. So I divorced my old country, South Africa. Um, I'm still friends with it, but we're not living together anymore. Um, uh, I had to say goodbye to my old life, like riding horses in the mountains in South Africa and lots of other nice things there. Uh, there was a mad car chase and I landed up in a new country. Um, Portugal was just the best sign on the road ahead, so I turned right and um, uh, we found a beautiful kingdom far away from, from where it was before um, and, uh, and a new place to call home. So a little house in the mountains with the trees and forest. It's like a fairy, fairy tale. Um, Now it's uh, freezing for my next slide. It's probably going to go. Uh, and it had a magical garden. And um, this is me doing my permaculture farmer things here, yeah, growing lettuce and onions. In a, this is what we call a stone spiral. The idea is you water the the plants at the top of the spiral and then the water runs down in a pretty pattern and waters all the plants on the way down, in theory. Um. <laughs> <laughs> we have some saucy bits, so we can make sauce from our, um, all the vegetables growing in the garden. I think it, uh, I lost one important slide, which was the mad, crazy animals chasing, so I'm going to go back quickly because it's a very important slide. I think it's the one that actually makes PowerPoint free, so I'll just wait here and... It's supposed to be playing some video here. <laughs> <laughs> this was pictures of puppies and things, so you're really missing out if you don't get the slide, but... Um, I don't know why it doesn't play. What can I say? I'll go to the next slide. And... Um, and then we have a happy ending with happy chickens until we eat them, but un until then they're happy chickens. And, uh, and the main character is walking off into the sunset. It's a really happy story. And um, so that's kind of the story of what, what, um, what's happened with me. And then I'm going to tell you a bit about the data behind the story and how we actually um, kind of uh, how I mapped my story. So normally the story I tell you why and then how and then what, but I'm going to tell you what and then why and then how, because I probably run out of time if I get too excited about some uh, ER diagram or something, and then uh, uh, at least you can see the important things in the start of the story. So let me tell you what I made first of all. If anybody follows me on Twitter, you've probably been heavily spammed with what I made. Um, I actually need to take out my bag because I'm supposed to pass around props and ask you to look at it enthusiastically while I do my talk. Um, so, yes please, thank you. Um, so you can pass around and look. So what I made was, um, uh, I made a report in QGIS. There's a, it's like I'm seeing double. It's a, um, <laughs> <laughs> There is a famous QGIS developer holding it and looking very excited to be holding it. It's, uh, it's, uh, 
It's a map of all the land that I, f I discovered and uh, printed in one single report from QGIS. I press one button. It's the print button and uh, in QGIS, and uh, it prints everything out together. Here's another famous phosphor G organizer admiring this beautiful map fold out on the, on the report. Um, and in the report, um, it's obviously got a picture of the fairy tale house, and um, it, I managed to ba basically put some like front matter together, trying to make almost like a book, but it's a book atlas. And uh, you can have different sections in your report in QGIS. Can I ask who's used QGIS reports before? Not the layouts, they're not the old one, the new one? Yeah, oh, only a few of you, all missing out. So that's why you're here today, to find out what you're missing out on. Um, reports is like the next generation of printing for QGIS and you can really do quite sophisticated things. So what I did was in the report I um, made like an atlas for each um, building in the, in my, on my land and I made these little sketches. Some people think I'm really artistic. I'm actually just really good at tracing pictures on my tablet with a pen. But uh, I, I dedicated quite a bit of time to sitting there doodling away, drawing these pictures. So I drew a picture for each building and um, and then you can, I also made a section to map all the plants um, and I hand drew some icons. I haven't been there long enough to have icons through all the year, but the idea is that for every plant you have like what happens with that plant. Is it fruiting? Is it flowering? Is it dying or falling over or um, growing, wa needing watering, what have you. Uh, and then as you can see each page for that plant type, you can see what, uh, what am I supposed to be doing? Those who know me well know I'm quite forgetful, so this is kind of just a way to remember to water the plants in May or, or what have you. Um, and then I also made um, uh, sort of uh, different infrastructure maps, all of them the same report. So, um, uh, and I created some custom North Arrows and uh, banners and things to, to decorate my maps with. Uh, and then I did some, uh, like a map of the camps and a map of the electrical infrastructure. Uh, and then here in this report you can see I've got different, four different um, subsections in the report. We have pulled out tables that relate to, this, uh, to each camp. And you can pull out like a plant list or a list of the points of interest or the water features or what have you. Um, so really just trying to show all the power that you can do with reporting, pulling out different pieces of data and putting it together on a single page. And of course, a nice picture of the camp. Um, and then there's some 3D nerds in the room. There's one here again. <laughs> um, and uh, there's another one there. Wave to the room, 3D nerd. <laughs> um, and uh, they helped me to do some cool stuff, some visualizations. Uh, I mapped all the trees on the land. Uh, I'm trying to map my land to the nth degree. So eventually, I want to have every rock and pole and everything mapped and then I can model it in a beautiful model um, on my land. And so in the report you can print um, a 3D scene from your, from your project. Uh, and then I made a big uh, fold-out one and I'm trying to show here some map decorations you can put around the side. This I hand sketched, not even copied from a photograph, this one I should, should add. Um, and then a back page. So that's what I made and then I will show you now a little bit about um, why I made it. Um, and there's really only two slides for why I made it. This is the first slide. Uh, this is what I got when I bought my land. It's, I guess, from like 1853 or something. I don't know when it's from. It was a hand-drawn piece of paper. And the man in the finance office kindly used a symbology style to mark the <laughs> outer boundaries of the land. I think it's the felt tip renderer marker or something. I'm not sure which one he used. but. Um, and of course you can see it doesn't have quite the same level of detail a GIS nerd like myself might expect on a map of his new property. So um, I set about to fix this glaring emission in the, um, in the state of data for my farm by mapping it myself. Uh, and the other reason I did it was I wanted to, I normally build things for clients and I, they tell me what to do and I have to, you know, do stuff that maybe is interesting for me and maybe not. Um, but here I could make something with all the bells and whistles that I really like and try to make like a fully worked out QGIS project and really um, explore what you can do in QGIS. So, um, so let me tell you how I made it a little bit. Uh, this is the process I follow and uh, I normally 
teach, when I do training, I tell people to follow some kind of process like this. Like, think of your topic. And we did like a, a course on uh, mapping electrical infrastructure in Africa. That was their topic was, where's all the electric lines or what have you. My topic was, where's my chickens, where's my rock, where's my tree, whatever. So you think of your topic, and then you come up with a data model. And that's if anybody's used a database design tool, so like you make an entity relationship diagram. That's a good place to start rather than just um, making a shape file and just start drawing dots on the map or something like that. Because then you kind of have a plan of how everything should fit together. I made a data model and I actually modified it many times in the process, but at least I had a kind of vision of what I was trying to build. And then I built uh, some cartography rules and uh, tried to think about how this map should look um, to make it you know, as exciting and beautiful as it could be or, or as functional and useful. Um, and then I made forms. The forms are important because I'm doing field mapping and capturing data from uh, raw state. If you've got existing data you're trying to use in your GIS, maybe you don't need the forms, maybe it's something that's not necessary. But uh, for my case, I was going to have a lot of forms because I was capturing all these details about all the things on my farm. And then you've got to go out in the field and collect. And uh, that was the fun part. Of course, I was looking really for an excuse to go and walk around the fields with my tablet and look at trees and take pictures of them and just enjoy being outside. So that's an important part in the process. And then you've got to come up with a report. So that's the report, I f uh, the, the process I followed. And uh, these are just some examples of the data model. You don't have to study this, no test afterwards about whether you can remember everything on here. But just to give you an example of like uh, for plants, I created a plant table and a plant activities table, like what each plant does in each month of the year. And I had uh, a, a table for where the actual plant vegetation points um, are. And then I created an infrastructure and buildings model. Um, and I had two kinds of infrastructure, one point infrastructure like taps or um, um, drinking points for animals or what have you. And then I had um, uh, structures like buildings and so on. And I did a little bit funny thing there. I created an extra model for the roofs. That's because, again, the same nerd on my left here told me um, you can't make your roof as part of your same building structure, you need another thing in 3D because uh, I want my roof to be above the building at its own pitch angle and so on. Uh, so I created a separate model just to draw roofs in. Uh, and then for the water related things, um, I had like line and point models, lines for rivers and water lines and points for taps and things um, and so on. Uh, and I also had polygons for, like, I've got a few little dams and ponds and things around the farm. So this is the starting point in your situation. You're doing something else. You go through a similar process. Maybe you'll have 100 tables, although I advise to try to keep your model simple because you need to understand what the hell you did, you know, in a year's time and what, how the stuff fits together, but sometimes it will get complicated. Um, and then... Uh, the next thing I did was I started collecting uh, resources to do the cartography and the mapping and, uh, well, not the mapping, the map generation and um, so on. So I kind of started sketching on my tablet. Um, uh, and if you want to, you can come up afterwards and I'll show you some of, I'll show you my project running the tablet and so on. Um, but I started sketching things and uh, making borders and uh, leaf pictures and doodling away like back when I was um, in primary school just drawing little pictures of planties and things. It was great fun. And I also decided to make my own north arrows and things and just to try to build something that's not just the generic uh, pictures you find in QGIS. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, I sketched all the buildings and I also found online uh, some sources of tiled rasters, which are nice if you're using the raster, uh, what's it called, the raster fill style, yeah, which, um, which basically you can fill a polygon with a continuously repeating raster and make your grassy fields look grassy uh, or what have you. Um, uh, and then the super nice guy that I mentioned down there, say hi again, Raymond. Uh, <laughs> he... Uh, he was at the Hackfest that we had a few days, excuse me, um, Professional Developer Conference for QGIS, also known as the Hackfest. Um, and I said to him, man, I need some trees. And uh, he said, well, you come to the right place. I'm a tree guy. I can build trees in 3D for you. So uh, it was a match made in heaven. Uh, 
And we actually, uh, I had trees before, and if you're working in 3D and QGIS, one of the sort of limitations with 3D models is that they all get painted the same color. So I didn't like my tree stems and my tree leaves being the same color. I took offense to that, and uh, Martin saw my offense and had a great suggestion to separate away the leaves and the stem. So back to the other nerd, and he made me a model for the tree, uh, for the stem, and a model for the leaves. And then I put the two in the map next to each other and could give them different colors. Yeah, I was very happy. And then uh, he came and admired my nice report later. Um, and then I also made a bunch of crap. And uh, with stuff I threw away, I was really, like, really bad artistic choices or uh, pictures of sheep which aren't actually my sheep which weren't relevant to my report and things and that I'd collected or just aggressive chickens who seemed to offend everybody that looked at their pictures so I really uh, had a lot of junky stuff there that I also just made but never used uh, and then the next thing I did was I developed forms uh, who's used the drag and drop form designer in QGIS if you haven't, you're really missing out because uh, it makes your forms look much nicer. You can put them in tabs and groups and uh, organize things better than you can with just the default, what's it called, uh, auto-generate form option. So I used that throughout. I also hid things like IDs because us normal people in the world don't want to see IDs. They like something for computer scientists, but when you're walking the tree, a tree doesn't have an ID number, it has a name and it has some branches and things. So I hid away stuff that shouldn't be seen in the, in, uh, in the field and, uh, and also put some things in that um, I wanted to have on every record but didn't want the users to have to think about, like the name of the user and the date that they captured the record. These kind of things you can generate all in QGIS uh, automatically. Uh, so uh, I kind of built all that stuff and then um, in QGIS uh, you can now click on a thing like I've clicked on a tree here and uh, see a pretty picture of the tree and you can also um, capture all the details with nice lookups. Um, uh, I made heavy use of these things called value relations. Okay, I'm very fast running out of time. I'll, um, I'll speed through the last few things. So value relations um, let you like link two tables together. Anybody heard of them? Raise your hand, yes. Yeah, those of you who don't use them, you're really missing out. Um, you should try them out. <laughs> uh, um, and, uh, and then I built my cartography. It's kind of boring cartography. You might be expecting to see splashy pictures of, I don't know, exploding almond shells or something, but um, it's very functional. And uh, the difference in my cartography between um, uh, the black and the grey is things that I've actually surveyed and taken photos of. Um, I've got a lot more slides and they're not going to play because they've got videos anyway. But um, I'll skip past the video bits. And uh, I think it's just stuck. Um, and I did some cool stuff like drawing uh, some cartography uh, by hand because you can't actually make you just render things like this. So uh, uh, what I did was I drew this outline um, and then georeferenced it and put it back into my map so that I could have some cool styles, which just thinking out the box, you know, playing with the tools that you have. And, um, uh, and I had some rules, like I said, so anything gray is uh, no photo. Anything black is got a photo. So when you're in the field, you can see, okay, I haven't done this tree, you just click it and then you can get, catch a photo of it. Um, I made heavy use of styles and themes and I've got one piece of sage advice for you is avoid using styles and themes at all cost. And my corollary to that is you should use styles and themes a lot because they're really great. But the reason I'm giving you two conflicting pieces of advice is because they add some complication to your life. Keeping track of what style belongs to what theme and where to change it and how to update it, it can make your head go a bit loopy. But uh, at the same time it allows you to unlock a lot of the power of QGIS. Uh, I also use styles to do some like, poor man's um, uh, topology checking. So I've got one minute, okay, thanks. Uh, so for example here you can see there's a sliver in my data set. It should be uh, all nice uh, topologically correct polygons. Um, and I used all sorts of tools like topology checker and things to find them, but actually it's much easier just to make some cartography with some big thick lines that uh, shows the union of your, of your polygons and then you see that straight away when you, when you digitize it. Uh, I just created a simple view in Postgres, two lines, three lines, 
makes a union of all your layers and anything that shouldn't be there um, shows up immediately. It's quite a nice way to, to do that. Okay, I'll have to stop here, so I'm going to just close with my 3D fly through, which probably won't play. Oh, maybe it will play. Okay, there we go. So, we should have Star Wars music. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> this is the sum of the, the work that we did with Raymond's trees and um, all trees sorts of. Sorry? I do have trees in my building, and that's not a mistake. <laughs> that, is an <laughs> that is an interesting quirk of my property, um, but, <laughs> but very well observed. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. I had a lot of other slides, which while we're answering questions, I'm going to randomly press the clicker button, and then you can see them <laughs> that kind of way. I can sneak five more slides into my, my time. Okay. <laughs> I can offer you a trade. I have my next presentation. I can give you 10 or 15 minutes. Ah, time. is yours very short? But with one condition, keep <laughs> the whole people here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll make the deal. <laughs> I don't know how that's going to work for the video streaming, but maybe your presentation will look a bit funny. I, I don't mind. My wife will be confused. <laughs> <laughs> About four minutes for Q&A and for advancing through. Okay, okay. So, uh, any questions, anybody, while I click? I'm trying to I click, but... Uh, yes. Uh, how, how come your property looks like uh, Africa? At least half of it. This is an interesting and totally accidental um, side effect of moving there, and the other half kind of looks a bit like Portugal if you use your imagination a lot. So <laughs> it was, it was just some kind of mystic destiny that I that I had. Um, I, I had some slides showing uh, input in Portugal, which uh, input and Q field. That was a weird mistake to make, <laughs> but um, which I'm going to flip through while anybody else may ask a question. I know Jürgen Fischer is dying to ask a question as well. <laughs> uh, just joking. Uh, I was going to ask, how did you do the mobile data entry? <laughs> okay, that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Stealth slide injection. Uh, so yes, I did it using Q field and input, and they're all my friends, so I won't express any preference. In fact, I don't have any strong preference. They're both awesome tools. I did do some quite exhaustive testing probably irritated both uh, <laughs> groups of them quite a lot while I was moaning about bugs or trying to do things that they weren't really intended to do. But um, I can show that uh, they're really powerful. There are a few small differences between them. If you take my slide deck uh, uh, off the wherever they go in, uh, on, the, on the conference program, you can, you can sort of have a look these, through these. And these differences are changing all the time. Often I share these things and then they say, oh no, we've done that already. So do check in with them to see if the difference actually still exists. Oh, you do it? Yes. Okay. I think you do it, but they don't. Maybe I got my slide the wrong way around. <laughs> and um, yeah, so uh, I used input and Q-field and... Uh, we do uh, <laughs> through themes or through direct layer? Okay. Okay. We have to update the slide. I'll make some quick edits. Yes. Um, somebody wanted to ask something? Um, and so uh, I can tell you that for the field data collection, one very important thing is your choice of tablets. Um, I, I started off buying the cheapest, crappiest tablet that I could find, um, and the GPS was so bad that the signal was jumping all over the show, and it was a really bad experience. So invest a little bit mo more money in a tablet, and uh, in a good tablet, and you'll have much better experience. Uh, anybody else got some questions? Thank you. Uh, you have talked about the GPS and all the data acquisition. Uh, how did you come up with the 3D models of your buildings? Did you use some extra instrument or distance meter or what was that? Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, for the 3D models, um, that's a bit obscene when I look at it like that, but it's not meant to be <laughs> <laughs> an elephant doing having a pee on, a, on an Android. But uh, um, <laughs> Uh, for the 3D models, all I did was I used uh, uh, two and a half D geometries for every polygon in PostGIS, 
and for every feature, actually. Um, I try to uniformly give them all two and a half D geometries, and, um, uh, and then I kind of just estimated what the building height was. And my form in the field, I estimate the building height, and I translated that onto the 2D geometries. Uh, and for the roofs, I did it purely manually. I looked at the roof, and I thought, OK, that's four meters at the, at the pitch highest part, and you know, three at the lowest part. And then I put it in the 3D environment and I saw sometimes it's cutting through the edge of the wall or something that didn't look so good. Then I just, um, uh, you know, jimmied it until it came out right. But, uh, you know, ideally I'd have some fancy equipment, but I was doing this like in the, in the cheap and nasty way. Yeah. Thank you. Last question. Yeah. Uh, do you know of about any plans to improve uh, report mode? Because I am, it, it, it's powerful, but it doesn't have a preview mode, and uh, it's quite basic in the user interface. Uh, so, are there any plans? Uh, yes, and this is where I will um, uh, promote the work of Niall Dawson, who's, who wrote um, the reporting uh, module. He's from North Road. Um, you Google him, you'll find him. Uh, he, we've got a long list of improvements, including these kind of things, and. Uh, Please help him fund his work because it's the reporting stuff is awesome, but it needs a little bit more love. You can do all this what I've shown you, but you do need to um, be prepared to you know work with some of the limitations that the current environment has. So yeah, please go fund his work. Okay, thanks. I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>